of Singapore, the Asian Civilizations Museum, and Victoria Theatre, who have been very generous in allowing us to use their wonderful venues. Um, I also have to tell you, please, that uh, I have to remind you to please either put your phones on silent or turn them off so that we are not uh, disturbed in any way. And also, uh, photography is not allowed. So um, if you want to tag us on social um, media, please hashtag at Singapore Writers Festival and Singapore Writers Festival 2019. Now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Pico Aya to you. I'm sure actually he needs no introduction from me to anyone. His reputation precedes him everywhere. He's even been called the Poet Laureate of Wanderlust. He's an intrepid traveler and travel writer, novelist, essayist, friend of the Dalai Lama, longtime part-time resident of Japan, and in all ways, Pico is a truly global soul. His latest book is Autumn Light, um, Japan's season of fire and farewells. It's a wonderful meditation on both Japan and the transience of life. Pico's going to talk to you about the book, and then he and I will have a short dialogue conversation together, and then we're going to open the session to the floor because I'm sure you all have lots of questions. Um, I would like just to tell you that Pico is an old friend of mine. I've known him for, I think, 30 years, Pico. <laughs> for both of us, our lives are destined to be intimately entwined with that of Japan. Pico lives in Nara, and before I came to Singapore, I lived in Kobe for more than 35 years. Even before I finally met Pico, I used to hear from people about the only other foreign writer who lived in Kyoto Nara, both of us very strange anomalies in a deeply conformist land. So many years have gone by since those early days. I return regularly to Japan, and reading Autumn Light, I was filled with nostalgia for the country where I spent so much of my adult life. I just returned last week from the mountains of Nagano, and I'm still filled with the resonance of that visit and the essence of autumn, the season of transition filled with bittersweet beauty of loss and decline. Loss and decline and a deep sense of life's impermanence fill autumn light which is a very personal and a very intimate book. And I now invite Pico to talk to you a little about Autumn Light. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mira, for such beautiful and soulful words. Mira knows 10 times more about Japan than I ever will, so I'm really eager to get to the conversation part of this evening, but, or this morning. <laughs> Sorry, I'm jet lagged. I'm 16 hours out of sync, and I'm still in California where it's 3.15 a.m. But I can't believe so many people here on a bright Saturday morning. There are so many more exciting things you could be doing in Singapore today. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Many, many people under the age of 60, too, which one doesn't usually see <laughs> at literary events. So this is why one loves Singapore. Uh, I know I've never uh, been asked to speak in as imposing and stately a uh, hall as this one. I feel as if I ought to turn myself into Margaret Thatcher <laughs> instantly, or uh, <laughs> Boris Johnson, maybe. But uh, nothing I can say will be worthy of these surroundings, but it's really... Such an honor to be here, and always for me such a delight to be in Singapore. Uh, I was first here before most of you were born, I think, 1984. Uh, and as somebody entirely of Asian blood, but with Britain in my past, and always thinking about how to bring pieces of different places together 
in my future, I instantly thought of Singapore as a sort of younger brother. Um, I'm only eight years older than your republic, but I've always felt that Singapore's questions are very much my questions. And I was just working out, actually, last night. Over the years, I've stayed in at least 12 different hotels in Singapore. So I've got to know many corners of your city uh, and many corners of the day, too, because I used to fly over here from California and wake up every day at 9 p.m., have breakfast at 9 p.m., walk around Singapore all night long, trying to kind of register its subconscious, go back at 6 a.m. for lunch, no, yeah, lunch, and then have dinner at noon before sleeping. And so that opened up parts of Singapore I would never see otherwise. All of which means that as soon as uh, I brought out these two little books on Japan this year and an even littler book on Singapore, I knew that I wanted its, their Asian debut to be right here. Um, the last time I came to this festival was seven years ago, and I can't remember any literary festival where I've sensed such hunger and appetite. People were literally waiting for two hours to have their book signed. Um, and having grown up and grown old with Singapore, uh, I really feel as if the first maybe 30 or 40 years of the Republic, the main text was set in place, and now there's this exciting sense for me of the margins being decorated and expanded and more and more uh, cultural energy every time I come here. When I walk around that wonderful Books Actually store and see the books that they bring out, or when I go to the super sleek, cool Hugs Epigram coffee shop and I see people thronging in for events there, or when I go to Kino Kunia, which must have the best selection of English language books in Asia, I really think, well, Singapore is the place where every writer on this continent wants to be. Uh, as Mira was saying, uh, we're going to have a conversation uh, in a while. I've been asked to um, drone on about <laughs> Japan for about 35 minutes before that. And I've also been asked uh, to say a few words about language the theme of this year's festival before we get to Japan. And I was just thinking that we all know that to speak a language opens a door to any culture that nothing else can replicate. Probably in Singapore, to speak four languages is how you would get to the core of this city. But I always tell my friends when they're going to Japan for the first time that maybe more important than speaking Japanese is learning to speak silence or to speak nuance or to speak body language, because in my experience, my Japanese neighbors are often happiest the fewer words are spoken. Um, soon after I got to Japan, I found out that the ideal date in Japan takes the form of two people going off to a movie, watching it in rapt attentiveness, and then going home without saying a single word about the movie. <laughs> uh, because I think in Japan, they're keenly aware that words are what separate us and silence is what brings us together. And, si and bringing people together and creating a harmony and a common interest, of course, is just what Japan, probably like Singapore, is all about. Words can be used as weapons, as smoke screens, as diversions. And uh, again, many of you know, one of the reasons I love Singapore is that so many people in Singapore seem to love and know Japan, uh, that in Japan is the rare country where if you speak the language really well, I think a lot of Japanese people feel intruded upon or threatened, as if the clear lines between who's outside the circle and inside get blurred. And so actually, if you just speak four words in Japan, if you just say, hello, good morning, they're delighted. And they say, wow, your Japanese is so great. If you speak it perfectly, they're unsettled. Who is this person? Uh, is it a foreigner? Is it a Japanese? Is it somebody trying to turn from one into the other? Um, all of you probably also know that statistically, of the 30 countries in Asia, in terms of English language proficiency, Japan is tied for 28th, <laughs> ahead only of Laos. So far below North Korea or Cambodia, or Nepal or Indonesia. And I've been to North Korea a couple of times. English there is not Shakespearean. But, um, and it speaks, I think, for the sense of the distance that Japan is comfortable keeping with the rest of the world. And yet, um, even though so little English is, is officially spoken there, all of you who've been there know that you never have communications problems because the Japanese are so attentive, so good at reading other people's interests, and so good at speaking without any words at all that 
Um, language often is the least of one's problems, except when it comes to signs in Japan. I, I never forget, one day I went to visit um, the great singer and poet Leonard Cohen in his really dilapidated house in a broken part of Los Angeles. He was the most um, articulate and spellbinding writer I've ever met. And so we had a long lunch and he talked compellingly hypnotically about politics and literature and the journey of the soul, much else. And then at the end of the dinner, he just took two folding chairs and brought them out to the garden. And I followed him. And he sat in one and he invited me to sit in the other, looking out on this small bed of flowers and this quiet residential street. And then nothing. He didn't say a word. Minutes passed. Nothing. More nothing. And finally, I thought, well, maybe this is a gentle hint. So I said to him, oh, well, you must be busy. I should let you alone. And he looked up at me beseechingly. He said, please, don't go. And I was so touched to realize that he knew that silence was the deepest thing we could share. And that that was the real sign of intimacy and friendship, much more than any words that we might trade back and forth. And although he never spent much time in Japan, he spent 40 years in Zen practice with an aged Japanese teacher. And I think that's how he came to see that um, silence is more eloquent than almost anything that we could say. So I know uh, part of the theme of this year's festival is the political dimensions of, sil of silence and language. And I've always been most interested, I suppose, in the emotional or social aspects of them. Now, to get to uh, Japan in particular, six years ago, uh, I was at a literary festival, much like this one, in Florida. And suddenly, in the dead of night, the phone rang. And it was my wife, Hiroko, from her hometown of Kyoto, telling me that her father, who was 91 years old and had been bounding around Kyoto the previous week, had suddenly been taken into the hospital. And unfortunately, I had various literary uh, engagements in Florida. And three days later, the phone rang again, and it was Hiroko saying that her father was gone. And I think a death in the family everywhere is a wake-up call, and it's a cause for sober reflection. And I'm guessing that the emotions that follow upon such a death are pretty much universal. But in Japan, the rights that follow upon a death are very particular. Uh, as soon as her father died, Hiroko had to buy a very expensive Buddhist name to protect him in the afterworld. And she had to buy an even more expensive gravestone, which at certain points in the year is encircled by lanterns so that the departed can come back, look in on their much missed loved ones for three days, and then find their way back to their new home in the heavens. Uh, to this day, six years after um, that death, she wakes up very early every morning and she heats up water to make her father's favorite kind of tea and she gathers his favorite snack and she puts it out for him on the household altar, uh, which happens to be right next to the boom box on which she'll soon be blasting out Green Day's 21st century nervous breakdown. And Every day that she has a day off from her job, which involves selling semi-punky European clothes in a department store, she gets into a bus and a train and a second train and a third train for a two-hour trip each way to what in Japan is thought of as a city of tomorrow. Uh, in other words, a graveyard to fill in her long-departed uh, grandmother and her late father on all the family news. And I think in... A, a place like Singapore, none of you are probably strangers to these kind of rights. In a practical sense, as soon as her father died, she had to move her 86-year-old mother, whom her father had been looking after, into a nursing home. Uh, she had to get a will signed by her brother, which sounded very easy because he lives just 15 minutes away, but actually was quite difficult because he'd cut off the entire family 25 years earlier, on the grounds he said enigmatically that his sister had gotten a divorce. And our daughter came back from Spain, where she had been living, and came back with her Spanish boyfriend, but we didn't really know if she was back for good or if we would soon lose her, maybe forever, to Europe. And so overnight, we were in this wilderness of questions. 
And I came back into the autumn, and I always try very hard to be in the Japanese autumn, which comes to its finest flourishing this month, November, because many of you will know that the sky is a brilliant blue, absolutely cloudless, warmer than Southern California into the early days of December. But underneath that blue are the scarlets and golds and lemon yellows of the turning leaves. And of course, autumn in many a non-tropical country has this beauty. I used to live in New England, which is famous for its resplendent fall foliage. But there's something about the wistfulness of the Japanese autumn and the way the wistfulness plays off the buoyancy that really touches me. And the way in which, as Mira was saying, you realize that impermanence is not just a cause of sorrow, but actually a spur to joy, because we can't anticipate what's going to happen tomorrow, and so we have to find our beauty and our wonder right now. And they often say around Kyoto that life is about a joyful participation in a world of sorrows. And I think I feel that joy and that sorrow more deeply in the autumn than any other time. Uh, now, I should probably say, after all that high-toned stuff, that if any of you were to come to visit our flat, you'd be horrified. You'd really be appalled. Um, we live in a completely Western apartment, no exquisite tatami mats, no beautiful shoji screens. And our entire neighborhood was built in the 1970s essentially to look like a Steven Spielberg stage set. <laughs> Um, I wish I were exaggerating, but I'm not. So most of you know Japan well enough to know that um, literally nearly all the buildings in this neighborhood are Western style. All the streets, absolutely straight. Not a single shrine or temple in the entire community. And even the two main streets are called uh, School Dory and Park Dory, using the English names, I think to persuade my mostly elderly retired Japanese neighbors, they finally attained their dream of living in a Japanese version of California. But um, our suburb is on the brink of the ancient uh, city of Nara, which was the capital in the year 710. And again, many of you will know that Nara today is this big, bustling city of 350,000. Right at its heart uh, is the largest municipal park in Japan. And so downtown Nara is really nothing but temples, shrines, reflecting ponds, sutra houses, and most visibly, 1,200 wild deer who roam around, absolutely ruling the place. Um, if you go to the city hall building in Nara, which is this great five-story glass and concrete building, Literally, you'll find stags seated on the front steps, our, our city councillors. Um, if you check into the fanciest hotel in Nara, you'll be greeted not by doorman, but by doe. And I, so I think for me, this image of a makeshift, mock Californian synthetic suburb on the brink of somewhere very ancient and deep and filled with spirits is really how I see Japan even in the 21st century. Just across the street from our apartment for many years was a health club. And in those days, whenever um, she had a day off, my wife would wake up very early and put on headband and leggings and head across the street for eight hours of furious kickboxing <laughs> and high-intensity aerobics and weight training and jazzercise and yoga and who knows what. Um, you can see already her husband can barely stand at this podium without collapsing. I'm not exactly a paragon of athletic prowess. But my wife, as I said, is Japanese, and so she's graced with patience. And 17 years after we first met, 68 full seasons after we met, she came back from the health club one day, and she said, oh, didn't you used to play ping pong as a kid? Um, I confessed I had. Uh, and she said, oh, well, they're offering ping pong in the health club now. Gentle hint. <laughs> um, I didn't take it. I snarled something defensive. But a few weeks later, I consented to go across the street with her to look in on the ping pong. And as soon as I did, within three minutes, as she'd uh, imagined, maybe as she had feared, <laughs> I was lost for life to ping pong. Um, I have chosen to live in Japan for 32 years on a tourist visa in part because 
I've always felt that the official corporate Japan includes some of the less imaginative, imaginative and interesting parts of that culture. And I've always been drawn to everything private and, and interior and domestic, which to me is rich with surprises and secrets in Japan. But suddenly, in the ping pong club, for the first time ever, I was the lone foreigner in a group of 30 Japanese. Uh, retired executives, grandmothers, a proprietress or two of a red light bar. And at my towering five foot seven and a half, I was pretty much the tallest in the entire group. Uh, in my 50s, I was the youngest by decades. <laughs> Uh, and when my wife occasionally looked in on the ping pong, she was almost alarmed to see that her hairless, hapless husband was a kind of uh, Justin Bieber <laughs> figure. Um, really, my, most of my ping pong friends are in their 70s and 80s, so I'm a teen idol by comparison. Uh, and I think my neighbors are genuinely quite happy to have a token foreigner in their midst as a kind of mascot. And so ping pong became my way of... Um, learning to, how to fit into a Japanese circle, which among other things involves trying really, really hard at every minute, but never wanting to win. <laughs> and um, maybe I'll read um, a little section about how ping pong plays out in our neighborhood. Now I realize I'm gonna have to turn into sort of many-armed shiver now to <laughs> hold the pages, turn the pages, and hold the microphone at the same time. But since many of you are being forced to turn into human spaghetti to watch me, we're all at the same level. To enter Japan through the narrow gateway of ping pong. It didn't sound like any of the lofty ideas I'd had when I came over to Kyoto, weighed down by readings of old philosophers and poets. I'd moved to Japan, I thought, to learn how to live with less hurry and fear of time, and how to see how an old and seasoned culture makes its peace with the passing hours. I'd move there to learn how, to, how best to dissolve a sense of self within something larger and less temporary. But now, to step into the health club or on Saturday afternoons, the drafty old gym feels like stepping into the thick of a society in the middle of a convivial, long-running drama in which I have to tease out every turn and nuance. At the ping pong club, I have to learn how to be invisible and how to read the unwritten rules that guide us. How to compete not to win, but to make sure that as many people as possible can feel that they are winners. How, in short, to be a voice within a choral symphony, not just some soloist tootling off on his own. Soon after Hiroko urged me to give the game a try, I stepped into the studio to be greeted by a smooth, warm man in his late 60s with rimless glasses and a few words of English. Next to him was a smiling, shiningly gracious woman who might have been welcoming me to an elegant dinner party. As they introduced me round, Pico sounds a writer, he comes from California. The emperor, as I began to think of him, inducted me into the customs of the place. The sign-up sheet, the 30-minute segments, the way we had to run up and down the studio in parallel lines with mops as soon as we were through to make sure that the space was as immaculate as when we had entered. Then he started seeking out players of my level with whom I could practice. Very soon, however, I sensed that it was everything silent, as always in Japan, that bound us together. My friends were exceptional when practicing. Even the weakest players could keep a high-speed rally going for minutes. But get them into a game and hit it where they weren't expecting it, and they were instantly at a loss. They were born for duets, I realized. Playing with each other was their strength, treating each other as a part of themselves, as in a dance or an act of love. Playing against each other never would be. I learned, therefore, never to say a word about the result of any game, even though some of my friends would hoot and improvise a war dance if they scored a victory. 
In any case, we switched off pairs so rapidly that nobody lost for long, and best of two sets guaranteed there weren't so many losers. If ever there was just one person in the room when I entered, I learned never to contemplate a game of singles. Our job was to rally with each other until two others showed up and practiced enough to be ready for some doubles. I learned never to leave so long as there were even numbers in the studio. One person's departure would throw three others out. And discreetly to leave as soon as a newcomer arrived if that left us with an odd number. If ever I did go home before the others, I had to turn towards everyone when I reached the door, bow very deeply, and say, please excuse me for leaving before the rest of you. One afternoon, as I was exchanging forehands with the Federer graceful empress, her husband placed a kindly hand on my shoulder and said, Pika-san, why don't you hit a few with Nakai-san? Nakai-san was a tiny man with a sweet, clumsy smile and the air of a geek, not least because he was the only one to come into the studio carrying a stylish man purse instead of an Adidas bag full of equipment. He hit my balls back, but always a little bit tentatively, like a boy in a science lab who's trying to pour some semi-poisonous liquid into a test tube. I learned how to take spin off my shots so he could always block them back, and soon we were something of a dance team ourselves. One bright morning, however, I saw him stepping out of a long, very new black Mercedes sedan outside the post office, leaving the engine running. And I realized, many months too late, Nakai-san was a professional gangster. <laughs> The rare soul who had decided to ignore that section of the health club registration form that requests every prospective member to confirm, I have no tattoos and I am not a member of any criminal organization. And I, well, I was the ideal person to be encouraged to play with him as a kind of outlier too. And I think one of the reasons I really enjoyed being in the health club was it was my first chance to meet Japanese men. And I think it's relatively easy for foreigners to make contact with Japanese women, old or young, because, sad to say, I think they're still very much relegated to the margins of Japanese society and really given no scope for movement or opportunity in the public sphere, and so they naturally ally themselves with foreigners. But for so long, my image of Japanese men were these guys in three-piece suits yawning at six in the morning as they stood across the street at the bus stop waiting to go off to their jobs, uh, barking impatiently at convenience store clerks. Um, and as I saw it, really turning their backs on their wives and children to support them only economically. But in the health club, suddenly I was meeting them when at last they were free of their responsibilities. And they were really as charming and irresistible as little boys again. They were as engaged as grandfathers as they'd been seemingly neglectful as fathers. And they were really getting a chance to claim fun and human freedom in a way that they hadn't through all their working years. And as I began to speak to them, I noticed that many of them had been born in the late 1930s. So they'd grown up during the dark days of war seven years of harrowing occupation, and then they joined to Toyota and Mitsubishi and Sony and constructed what we used to call the Japanese miracle. Really, the whole history of contemporary Japan was in my new friends. And one thing I always like is that every now and then a teenager will show up in the health club, and one of these guys, aged 83, will just thrash him, <laughs> reminding me that really, Autumn has strengths that spring would envy, and that life doesn't go in a straight line, and that in certain ways we're often much stronger when we're old and when we're young, in the same ways as we're often much wiser in our 20s than in our 60s. And so this particular autumn that I describe in this book, Autumn Light, went on, and I think all of us were very keenly aware that when a couple has been together for 60 years, if one of them dies, often the other one goes very soon thereafter. So we were really worried about my mother-in-law. And we were still waiting to see whether my missing brother-in-law would ever come back to say goodbye to his late father or to his now fast-failing mother. And of course, I began to think about my own mother 
then 82, living alone uh, on top of a mountain in California, regularly surrounded by forest fire flames. And thinking how, if I was looking after my mother-in-law, I was neglecting my mother, but if I was tending to my mother, I was ignoring my mother-in-law. And every now and then, um, friends will come from the West and visit me in, in Japan. And they'll nearly always ask about religion there. And I often hear myself say that, to me, really one of the guiding religions in Japan, as probably in classical China, is the seasons. Um, which, of course, is a religion without texts or dogma or exclusions, but it's a constant teaching about changelessness and change. Uh, as in classical China, there's 72 seasons in every year in Japan, so the season changes every five days, and so do clothes and food and everything that's defined by the seasons there. And certainly, four weeks from now, in late November, when these tiny five-pointed maples blaze against the blue, nearly all my neighbors will put on their Sunday best and they'll flock out into temple gardens and parks. I think much as people elsewhere might go to church, um, to be joined in a congregation and really to be reminded of forces much larger than we are that keep us in place and to catch flashes of light amidst the coming darkness. Uh, Japan actually has a different word for the self that exists in private from the self that's out loose in the world. And I think even more than in England, it's assumed that there'd be no relation between private and public self. And I've always thought that the cherry blossoms, which are of course fluttery and pink and giggly, little erotic, that speaks for the self that Japan likes to present to the outside world. But I feel deep down at its heart, it's the maple leaf and that mingling of radiance and melancholy. Uh, some of you may know the films of the great Japanese director, Ozu, from the 1950s, Tokyo Story and Late Spring. And if you do, you'll know that very often there'll be the sound of a festival in the streets, even as somebody is weeping in the room next door. And that, to me, is exactly what Japan is all about, and I suppose it's what I was trying to do and catch in this um, small book. So uh, maybe I'll read a little bit about autumn in our neighborhood. <clears throat> As November dawns, we step into a world of light. The whole room seems to pulse with smudged gold as the sun rises above the hills beyond us and comes through the diffusing thick panes of our frosted glass windows. I remember my surprise when Hiroko told me that the builder of this place, who ended up calling it Memphis Apartments in honor of Elvis, originally wanted to make it a church. The heavy pebbled glass spreads light as if it were incense. Now she puts Bach on our system, and very soon the sun is making gold stripes across the terrace with such extravagance that I'm pulled in every direction all at once. A great rejoicing, so it feels, which awakens gratitude and delight, but the sun is passing across the terrace earlier and earlier, and by mid-afternoon, it will disappear behind a roof. It's nearly impossible to stay indoors on a day like this, not least because so many around me are being pulled almost magnetically out into the sharpened sunshine to marvel at the fact that the sky is so blue even as the leaves rust and begin to flutter down. Many of Kyoto's temples open their doors after nightfall now, another of the city's fresh and ingenious seductions, and soon we'll be following lanterns past stands of bamboo, eerily lit up, or we'll watch for fast-moving ghosts holographically projected against rock-sand gardens. In the shallow crystal pond of Kodaiji, the five-pointed maples are almost more brilliant than on the trees that the temple's water reflects. In our private lives, however, we're perched on the edge of a cliff, and the slightest movement could send us tumbling over. Every time I come back to the flat, I look by instinct for the green flashing button on the phone. No news is likely to be good news. And when I walk into the park, I can't help but wonder 
how often my mother-in-law will see the maples again. I take myself to banish the thought to the nearest shrine where the light is slicing the courtyard into diamonds, and I notice, as never before, that people have placed coins around rocks all across the forest. There are stone lanterns everywhere, as if the whole wilderness was some haunted church. I decide to take a train into central Nara today. I can't afford to squander this moment. And in the sun-washed carriage, I find myself looking at the hands on every side of me, tapping away on a smartphone, tightly gripping the handle of a designer bag, holding a toddler steady as the train rocks and rattles. The one part of Japan in which age cannot be concealed, hands tell the truth, even when mouths and eyes cannot, is also the most beautiful. In the deer park, an old woman has set herself on a bench to transcribe the autumn colors in a sketchbook. Two toddlers are stumbling their way into learning to walk on the grass nearby. A deer is chasing some poor visitor into the store next to where special deer cookies are on sale for the equivalent of $1.50 each. If they're true messengers of the gods, these deer speak for gods as ungovernable as Zeus or Hera. Around me, there's a chorus. Wow, aren't the maples beautiful? And the chorus itself lends brightness to the day. A woman leads her dog, wrapped in a red blanket, up a slope and stops to tilt her head up, up, up to where the leaves are picked out against the blue. Quite something, no, she says to her four-legged companion. A young girl in a denim jacket with frills guides her grandmother very slowly by the hand, then sets her down in front of the turning leaves, a classic autumn tableau. Would you like? A passing woman suggests, and the girl hands over her camera and hurries off to take her place next to the old lady. Now you, says the granddaughter, springing up. Across the world, people are marking the day of the dead today. But in this park, the air so cleansed that the trees seem to gleam in the freshened morning, it's not skeletons I see so much as aging elders struggling for breath. Dying is the art we have to master, it seems to say, not death. Late love settles into us as spring romances never could. Um, I think in this book, just to bring this to a merciful conclusion, um, I was trying to remind us of all the ways in which Japan is very close to Singapore or California or England. I think when you first go to Japan, what really hits you is the zany Western, modern stuff that's always covered very exhaustively in the media. Um, the hotels staffed almost entirely by robots, uh, the wild goth fashions, uh, the phenomenon which has been getting a lot of press in the West recently, <clears throat> whereby if an aging couple don't have a daughter anymore to look in on them, or if she's moved to California with her Western husband, they'll literally go to an agency and hire an actress to come and knock on their door every Sunday at noon and say, hi, mom, hi, dad, I've really been missing you. Let's spend a beautiful Sunday afternoon together. And they will suspend disbelief to fill that hole in their hearts. And I think sometimes it sounds strange to people in other parts of the world, but in Japan, it's a very practical solution to a very real problem. At the same time, of course, if you live in a family, in a community, in a neighborhood, you see it's really the same story as anywhere else, even if it's playing out in a different script. And when I go to my neighborhood post office, all the women are talking about the waiting lists in nursing homes and how they feel really guilty if they move their mother to a nursing home, but really frazzled if they don't. And how I suppose we're experiencing the human equivalent to climate change, whereby August is visiting in mid-February, and we're living longer than humans have ever lived before, but that means living for many years after our memories and our minds have begun to come apart. Um, so in some ways, this book, Autumn Light, is a little bit of a book for anybody who's ever experienced an autumn, uh, or known a loss, or had a parent. But on the one in a million chance you don't love this book, 
I actually did something crazy, which is bring out an absolutely contradictory book about Japan at the same time for the same publisher to come out at the same season called A Beginner's Guide to Japan. And if this first book is about the many ways Japan is so similar to anywhere else at the human emotional level, the second book is about all the ways it's radically different. And Autumn Light is meant to be, I suppose, a chance for a Japanese neighborhood almost to present itself unmediated to you. And the second book is a chance for you to talk back to it. In other words, it's all the wild generalities that would come to anyone in this room if she arrived in Narita Airport near Tokyo tomorrow for the first time. And it addresses burning questions I'm sure have been on your minds for decades now, such as how does an evening with Meryl Streep possibly explain the whole of Japan? Why do Japanese baseball games end in a tie as nowhere else if the score is level after 12 innings? Why in Japan in an emergency do you not dial 911 but 119? And why in Kyoto is it sometimes better to say nothing at all than to say anything, as I was saying at the outset? Um, most of you can tell already I'm of Indian ancestry. <laughs> and one result of that is my mind is like a Bollywood stage set in hyperdrive, constantly singing, dancing, somersaulting, caterwauling in overbright, riotous colors. And so I worked very hard to keep all my ideas about Japan out of this book, Autumn Light, and then I stuffed them into the second book, um, which also explains why the wartime emperor of Japan in 1975 told a group of journalists, well, between pre-war Japan and post-war Japan, really, there's no difference, describing what we see as one of the tumultuous transformations of the 20th century. Um, and... In both books, I will just end by saying, since I was asked to talk about language, uh, they're very, very tiny books, and I spent 16 years essentially trying to make them as tiny as possible and to take as many things out as possible in honor of that great Japanese sense of subtraction. And you all know in the classical Japanese tatami room, if you go in, inside, there are often only two things, a vase and a scroll. Because there are only two things, you bring all your attention to that vase and the scroll, and you find everything you could want and much more in them. And I think even in a non-Japanese context, I'm sure many of you have had the experience of going into a loved one's room when she's not there, and you'll see maybe a strand of hair or a postcard on the wall or a letter that she's writing. And somehow she'll come home to you in all her hopes and her longings and her vulnerability is much more than if she were two feet in front of you talking. And I think we all know if we've lost somebody through a breakup or through a death that absence can fill us up more than presence. And the person who's not there is all around us and the people who are there barely register on our horizon. So um, these, these books are really essentially meant to be about silence and, and absence and everything that's between the lines or unspoken, which is where so much of life in Japan takes place. And so as the autumn um, that I am describing in the first book came to its conclusion, I found myself walking around uh, the temple where I'd met my wife 32 years ago, uh, whose abbot always used to call himself our Cupid. He was so delighted that we'd met on his home ground, but he'd passed away now. And I think Hiroko, like many people who lost a parent, would sometimes feel her father walking and talking through her. Um, I would return three times a week to the ping pong club. I'll be there on Monday and Tuesday the next coming week. And it's always a scene of great laughter and merriment. But every now and then I'd notice somebody was missing. And they'd never come back. And I'd hear the words cancer or hometown or death. And every November, uh, the Dalai Lama comes to um, Japan, and as Mira was saying in her introduction, I've been lucky enough to know him for 45 years now, so I and my wife travel across Japan with him every minute of his working day. And I thought it might be appropriate uh, just to end with one section in which we visit him in Kyoto and remember a trip we took and with him, taken with him a couple of years prior to that. <clears throat> as we say hello to the Dalai Lama, I recall the November day two years ago when we traveled up with him to a fishing village north of Tokyo laid waste by the tsunami of eight months earlier. A few miles out of the city of Sendai, we began passing along clean, modern roads 
lined by nothing but compacted trash, block-long rectangles of smashed cars and refuse, telephone poles listed at 45-degree angles, a solitary chair sat in what was the open skeleton of what had been once a living room. Buses bobbed on the water beside us. When we pulled up at Ishinomaki, hundreds had gathered along the road to greet the famous visitor. It was to see nothing but a flattened landscape which looked like pictures I'd seen of Hiroshima after the bomb. More than 3,000 had lost their lives in this village alone, many of them children. 19,000 had lost their lives. The Dalai Lama stepped out of the car and strode without hesitation to the people, mostly women, who had assembled in the street to see him. Many were sobbing or calling out in limited English, thank you, thank you. He held one person's head against his chest. He blessed another. He touched heads, shook hands, looked into one set of eyes, then the next, asking, what do you feel? Are you still sad? Please, he told them as the women sobbed and others pushed forwards, please be brave. Please change your hearts. You cannot change what has happened. Please help everyone else, help others become okay. The crowd fell quiet. Some of its members nodded. Too many people died, he went on. If you worry, it can't help them. Please, work hard. That's the best offering you can make to the ones you've lost. Rebuild your community as your country rebuilt itself after the war. It's the kind of advice that anyone might give, perhaps, but when he turned around to walk towards the temple that had survived, graved stones in the foreground tilted crazily over or knocked down entirely, I saw the Dalai Lama take off his glasses and wipe away a tear himself. Suffering is the central fact of life from his Buddhist viewpoint. It's what we do with it that defines our lives. Just one day later, we return with the Dalai Lama and his bodyguards to his hotel, hasten up in the elevator to the top floor and walk at high speed with him down the corridor to his room. His eyes are often red after a long day of events, but his pace never slackens. He's holding Hiroko's hand as he moves forwards. As in some physical expression of his teachings, he reflexively reaches for any set of hands to grab between his own as he strides along. Just before we arrive at his door, Hiroko says, Your Holiness, we must leave you now, but thank you for everything. He's on his way to Tokyo next day. We have obligations at home. Also, she says, and her voice begins to falter just a little, I want to tell you, my father passed away this year. Instantly, the fast-stepping monk stops. He looks at her directly. When? This year. What cause? No cause. He was old. His body was tired. He steps forwards and holds her for a long, long time. Then he steps back and looks searchingly at her. Remember, only body gone, spirit still there, only cover gone. Then he heads into his room and at the threshold turns around to wave at us briskly, good night, thank you, and then is gone as we head back into the golden flares of late afternoon. So thank you so much for listening so patiently. And now we, I'd love to invite Mira up and have our conversation. Hugo, thank you so much for that very, very interesting talk and those wonderful readings. So really thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a very irreverent and rather brusque question, so please don't mind. Um, 
You, I've heard you call yourself uh, a full-time citizen of nowhere. Um, you are a travel writer, and travel from your earliest beginnings has been part of your life. You're an Indian. You never lived in India. Born and brought up in the UK and US, and from an early age you went to school in the UK. So you were traveling uh, from a very small age. Um, you spend six months in California with your mother, six months in Japan with Hiroko, backwards and forwards. You never seem to tire. You never seem to get jet lagged like we lesser mortals. Um, but um, to me, travel seems to be about fleeing and pursuing. Um, there's a tension there. And I wonder um, what it is you see yourself fleeing and what you see yourself pursuing. What a beautiful question. Can you, can you hear this? Is this working? Uh, I think for a long time I was fleeing subtleness. I was fleeing the world I knew. I was fleeing anything I could take for granted. So I, to this day, I feel England is never the... Pl I could never write about England because I live in the illusion that I know England. And to me, it's like yesterday's breakfast. <laughs> it can't surprise me because my eyes are closed to it and my conversation is concluded. And England, you and I were saying before we came up here, has actually transformed itself yeah. dramatically, especially yeah. London, in yeah. my lifetime. And I've been delighted to witness that, and yet I don't think I'm open to England um, in the way that I would be to any other country. That said, um, whatever I was pursuing, I think I found full-time in Japan. So really, I would be delighted never to travel outside my neighborhood at this point, uh, to travel only in my imagination at my desk. Uh, and I would happily spend really every hour of my life in Japan. Now, as I was saying earlier, it helps to be a foreigner. I would never want to be Japanese. Uh, and maybe that's because, as you were saying, I've always been displaced a little from the place around me. And so therefore, I feel at home in the most foreign culture on earth. But at a deeper level, Japan really does feel like my home. So my, my mother would roll her eyes and say, it must have been your home in a past <laughs> life. But I think the nature of affinity is mysterious, but it's inarguable. We, we meet a stranger, we feel we've known her forever. And it doesn't matter why that is. That's, that intuition is probably truer than the things we can explain. And it's interesting. I mean, I love the question you ask, because just last year, I was visiting a classroom in California. And somebody said to me, don't you ever get homesick because you spend your whole life in motion? And I said, no, 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 no. I spent my whole life traveling and I went back and forth just as you were saying. And then I stopped and I said, no, actually I'm really homesick for Japan. Yeah. I miss the smell of the citrus smelling Daphne in late September. Uh, I miss that light I was describing slicing across my room day after tomorrow. Um, I miss the sound of public address announcements. Uh, and so maybe I am the curious kind of person who could only miss and make a home that I will never fully be part of. But um, I suppose as a writer, in my early days, I was fleeing the familiar because I thought it's only the novel that will stimulate me and set my imagination in new directions and throw open windows. But now I've come to think that actually the familiar is where I have to find my sustenance. And that's why I wrote a whole book about this boring seeming neighborhood the point of which was in part, it's easy to be excited by Kyoto with 1,600 temples and 17 yeah. World Heritage Sites. But how do you get excited by a 1970s mock California neighborhood, um, which you know in your sleep? And that's where I have to find my delight, and actually um, still, still do. I think what we're all seeking probably in our homes, our partners, or our lives is that mix of the foreign and the familiar. Uh, because we need the foreign to keep us engaged and surprised, but we need the familiar to keep us settled and emotionally to make us feel comforted. And so I think Japan, maybe because I have a Japanese wife and two entirely Japanese stepchildren that I've known yeah. for 32 yeah. years, offers both those things. How, how do you feel? Because you, you've been traveling at least as much as I. Well, that maybe leads me to my next question. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I have lived in Japan for, for 35 years, um, and I had a very different experience. I love Japan, let me not say that. I love Japan. I'm deeply attached to the country, appreciate everything. But 
I went at a very, very young age, probably too young, um, and it was too different. Um, when I went to Japan, it was still a post-war era. There were no bullet trains, there were no big roads. I lived in the middle of rice fields. But I lived there also as a woman, Pico. I lived as a woman, I lived as a foreigner, I lived as a writer. And on all three levels, I felt totally dismissed and invisible. Mm. And um, what I did want to ask you, uh, as I say, that leads me to my next question, was that in the Beginner's Guide to Japan, uh, in your chapter on the fairer sex, you say, Japan has taken the Confucian model of women and pushed it to the extreme. In response to all opportunities denied them in the public sphere, women have traditionally made the most of the private. Yet it seems to me that even in that private sphere, there are still great restrictions. And it's always very interesting to me in regard to that, um, that the world's first, I mean, really, the world's probably first great novel was written in Japan and written by a woman, The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu. Um, But I, I found that in modern Japan, uh, the writer, the woman writer, is not thought well of. And how do I know this? Because after I published, I think, my third novel, the Asahi Evening News sent a reporter to interview me. And she was a young, bright woman, and we had a very good interview. And she went off. And then I discovered she'd left a pencil case on my sofa. And this is a very un-Japanese thing to do, to be that careless. And I thought, ah, she's coming back. And she did. She called me, and she came back the next day. And um, she then proceeded, because the context of our meeting was very different. When she'd met me the day before, this was official business. She did her interview. Now she came back public and private. She came in, the, in a private capacity, in the private sphere to me. And she began to tell me about her life, which was very un-Japanese. She had traveled, she'd been engaged to an Indian, um, uh, but finally she had married a lawyer. But her father was a very well-known Japanese novelist. And he, he was dead when she came to me, but she had had the influence of this beloved father through her life. And she wanted nothing more than to write a novel. She said, I have a novel brimming in me. But she was not allowed to write a novel. She had married an up-and-coming young lawyer, and her in-laws were well-to-do people. And she said, uh, I am not allowed to write. I can write. I can, I'm a journalist. I'm allowed to be a journalist, but I'm not allowed to be a novelist because uh, a novelist, and especially a woman, uh, writing fiction is to reveal yourself. And this is not comely for a woman to do. And I have never forgotten that interview. And she said, in Japan, what, I wrote down what she said. One minute, she said, um, only men can write freely. We women have to shut it all away. So do you feel, Pico, you're married to a very uh, um, un-Japanese type Japanese woman who actually left a very traditional marriage to marry you? Um, do you feel things are changing for women? I mean, more, more and more women are refusing to marry in Japan. Yes. So my first year in Japan, as, as you remember, I, I wrote a book about the predicament of women yes. in Japan yeah. because uh, Japan seems so far behind the rest of the world. I think in its, in its treatment of women, of foreigners, of the LGBT community, of anyone who's different, doesn't know how to fit it within that harmonious system that they've created. And 31 years later, they haven't advanced at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm shocked at, I mean, the women are choosing to defect from the Japanese norm, and the divorce rate has increased considerably in the years I've been there, but Japan is still not offering them any opportunities whatsoever. If Prime Minister Abe were here, 
he would tell us all that a higher percentage of Japanese women work than in the US. But what he wouldn't tell us is that many of them are working at subsistence below poverty level wages. Single mothers have to work in prostitution to begin to support their kids. It's shocking. Which is why, as with the lady you mentioned, or with my wife, they have every incentive to learn other languages, to marry even unpromising foreigners, to join foreign companies. Um, at the same time, uh, it's interesting, I was just reading a book by the Japanese psychologist, Ahayo Kawaii, and he said, from Kyoto, and he said, the only real samurai in Japan are the women. And I think it hits a lot of us that the women are the one with inventiveness, imagination, spirit, brio. And sometimes my Japanese wife, though she has been working all these years, will say, who wants to be in that office like the typical Japanese man, working himself 16 hours a day to no apparent end? Uh, we actually, we're, we're written out of the system, and then our job is to find our own excitements and opportunities within those margins. I was just talking about Japan in New York two weeks ago, and we opened it up to questions, and a Japanese woman um, actually at the back of the hall stood up, and she actually gave a whole lecture about how spirited and bright and full of energy and determination Japanese women are. But I agree with you entirely that... Um, the situation isn't improving quickly enough. In the, f in the book I wrote about Japan my first year, uh, just as you were saying, I was noting how all the great early Japanese literature came from women, and they actually, that whole kana script yeah. was almost yeah. created for them and by yeah. them. Uh, and I wrote a lot about somebody called uh, Yoko Tsushima, who was another woman who, whose father was also a very famous novelist, and she became a wonderful novelist herself. So she luckily had the, had the confidence to break through the barrier that that journalist was facing. Um, I, when you began ask, on, asking the question or answering my question, I thought you might also be talking about exclusion in Japan, which you experienced. Yeah. Um, and I have too, very much. Uh, I remember in the late 1990s, really every time I flew back to Japan, every three months or so, I'd get strip searched at customs. Yeah. I would look exactly like what they didn't want to see coming into their country. And you know, I have darker skin than you, so they assumed either I was Saddam Hussein's cousin <laughs> or that I was an Iranian because they had a big problem with illegal immigration from Iran, or worst of all, that I, am, I was what I am, which is someone of Indian ancestry born in England and grew up in California. Well, you're coming on a tourist visa into Japan. You probably don't have to carry an alien registration card. Yes, well, exactly. Well, I, once, I, I once did acquire a spousal visa because oh, yeah. I, I could get one of those with a Japanese wife, and I realized it was much made for even more bureaucratic encounters than the tourist visa. So actually, they were fine with the tourist visa. It was only when I was at customs um, that, that they looked aghast. And then one day, I was flying in from Hong Kong, and there was somebody else of Indian descent there. And I asked him, innocently, does this happen to you? And he looked at me as if I was four years old. He said, of course not, because as soon as I go to the customs area, and there are 17 lanes, and there are men in 16 of them, and there's a woman in the 17th, I always go to the lane manned by the woman. And she says, oh, welcome to Japan. And she's very happy to, to see a foreigner, and she's not threatened by <laughs> foreigners. And she's certainly not inclined to strip search me. But, um, and so it spoke for that difference. At the same time, though, a part of me never got upset about that because I thought this is the flip side of so much of what I appreciate about Japan, mm -hmm. which is that it functions like a symphony orchestra. Each person knows her part, plays her part perfectly, and thus they create this beautiful harmony over 1,400 years. And a foreigner is like somebody who doesn't have the score, doesn't read music, and is coming in like a human time bomb to explode this thing that they've created so carefully. So I never felt bad that they weren't happy to see me. And as soon as I got through customs, of course, they couldn't have been more gracious and kind. I but I, they all, that's one reason I live on a tourist visa, to remind my neighbors, don't worry, I, I'm, I don't have designs upon your community. I'm not going to be a resident. Yeah. I know who I am, which is somebody on the outside. I mean, I think it's simply that in the hierarchical structure and the very special s structure of Japanese society, there simply is no place yeah. for a foreigner. And you can live in Japan 100 years, and you will never find a point of assimilation. And that is one thing that I have found uh, very warming here in Singapore, that a place has been made for me, although I am Singaporean now, and I am, and I always will be an outsider, but a place has been made for me. And that is very, very warming, and gives me a much better quality of life than I ever had in Japan. Yes. And you and I 
grew up with an England that was almost entirely about racial divisions. Mm. And now London is, the average person you meet on the streets is born in a foreign country. It's one of the most wonderful advertisements of the mingling of, of races and cultures. And it's interesting how, as we sit here today, the Rugby World Cup final is taking place in Japan this evening. Oh, yeah, yeah. And of course, the Japanese rugby team, many of you know, 16 of its 31 members are from New Zealand and Tonga. The captain of the Japanese team is called Michael Leach, great <laughs> Japanese name. Uh, the the two-time winner of the, well, the winner of the US Open, the Australian Open this year, Naomi Osaka, who's the face of the 2020 Olympics, um, is really the face of her father, her Haitian father. And she owes, I think, her strength and her huge serve to the Haitian part of her, even mm. as she owes her sweetness and modesty to her Japanese mm. mother. And it's interesting how, for a long time in the sphere of entertainment, but now in the sphere of sports, Japan is having to deal with the fact that all its stars are actually 50% Jamaican or Ghanaian or Nigerian or whatever, which used to happen in England when yeah, we were growing yeah, up. Yes, but, yeah. um, just, just to, to just retract to the, to the women's issue, feminist yes. issue, I, I will never forget um, when Margaret Thatcher visited Japan, um, there was a terrible debate. Was, they were really, uh, it was a problem because the Japanese men did not know in the parliament how to incorporate this woman, this powerful world, global woman um, coming to Japan. How were they to deal with it? And I remember reading various uh, articles in the papers, and it was really very funny. And then in the end, they got it. They decided she was like the mama-san in a bar. <laughs> and in that way, they, they knew how to deal with her. Yeah. I'm sure the Japanese women were happy to see her. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had a lot of questions for Pico, but our time is running out, and I do want to open uh, our session to the floor because I'm sure you will all have questions. So, shall we do that? Um, is there a mic that could be taken around? Look at all these unshy hands already. Oh. This is great. Hi. Hello. Hi, Pico. Thank you for the lovely session. Um, I noticed in your writing, um, and I just read Sun After Dark, that when you visit a place, you often describe the lights and the sky. Um, like when you were in La Paz, you, you describe the sharpness of the light because of the thinness of the air. So I just want to ask something perhaps a bit frivolous, but how much does the sky and the quality of the light of a place illuminate your writing about it? What a really beautiful question. Thank you. Nobody has ever asked me that before, and maybe nobody has noticed that before. I'm really honored. Um, so if my wife were right here now, she would say, this guy's a hopeless case. He doesn't care what he eats. He doesn't care where he sleeps. He doesn't care what he dresses like. But he's obsessed with light, and that is what he feasts on. And he's eating in McDonald's, and he's drinking Coke, but he's absorbing this light, and that's where he gets his, his sustenance. In La Paz, which you mentioned, it's particularly exhilarating because it's at 12,000 feet, so you've got that very sharp mountain light as in the Himalayas. Uh, but certainly the reason that, as you could tell, I wrote about autumn in this book was partly because of the clarity uh, of the light. And maybe this is another byproduct of growing up in England where we didn't see the sun for 21 years. <laughs> Our image of the world was this low gray sky, perpetual semi-drizzle, and one day designated to be sunny in the summer, which you'd probably be out of the country for anyway. So. <laughs> Um, it, it hit me, it hit me per, per, particularly with that background. But yeah, I'm very much magnetized um, towards the light. And I saw this wonderful documentary by, um, about Miyazaki, uh, the great Japanese anime director of Spirited Away and The Wind Also Rises. And I noticed that maybe classically Japanese, he takes his entire staff up to the roof every day uh, at dusk, and they just look at the sky. Uh, and that's, I think, partly how they make those exquisite drawings that are worthy of 19th century woodcuts. He spends his first three hours every day just walking around the neighborhood. And that's how I think he gets his vision. But maybe uh, one reason I was drawn to the Japan is that I find the people there are unusually appreciative of things that I would otherwise take for granted, including the color of the leaves and the sharpness of the sky. <laughs> 
Hi, Pico. Um, thank you again. That was um, absolutely beautiful to hear you um, talk. Um, I have uh, lived in Japan for nine years as well, and I went there very early on. Um, and I'd love to understand, of all the things that you've learned of its land and its people, were there things that you had to unlearn as well? And what would they be? Yeah, the things I had to unlearn are the other side of the things I had to learn. And the main one, which I was saying at the outset, is um, unlearning how to babble, <laughs> unlearning how to speak. Because I felt growing up in England and California, I was encouraged to learn how to speak a bit, quite a lot. And in Japan, I went there, as I was reading, to learn to be invisible, to say as little as possible, um, to, be, to define myself much less by individual me and much more by what's around me, um, and to try to be much more attentive to everyone around, me, around one. And I think you all know one of the startling things in Japan is when you meet a Japanese person, it seems to me all her attention is on making you comfortable, finding out what you want, learning about your life. She's not imposing her dogmas or agenda upon you, but she's uniquely responsive. And I'm using the female pr pronoun there, but I think even the Japanese men share that quality. They're drawing people out rather than pushing people back. And so I thought, well, this is a perfect complement to what I've learned in the West. And I moved straight from Midtown Manhattan, where I was in this 25th floor office four blocks from Times Square, to a single empty room on the back streets of Kyoto. And I thought, whatever happens in Kyoto, it will help me unlearn maybe the sense that New York is the center of the world. And, you know, I was in this very fast-paced job where it's easy to get caught up in an exhilaration and a set of values that I could never separate myself from. And I could never really investigate how deep does this happiness run and do I really um, subscribe to these values that uh, I'm willy-nilly embodying in my life. So Japan gave me that distance. It goes back to Mira's question about what I was fleeing. In that case, I was fleeing the sort of New York yuppie world and thinking, well, in Japan, I can unlearn all of that. Um, and whatever I find will be something I wouldn't have found in New York City. Uh, but I think when Mira was talking about um, when you first went there very young, I think it was maybe circumstance that took you, and one of the differences was it was choice. In other words, I really wanted to go to Japan. So I had to work through a lot of my illusions and romantic projections about Japan, but I went to Japan to unlearn in some ways. Thank you for such a great question. What effect, if at all, will Empress Masako have on Japanese society, particularly Japanese women? Um, my hearing is not very good. Sorry, could you? Okay. What effect, if at all, will Empress Masako have on Japanese society in years to come, particularly oh, on well, Japanese women? Thank you. I'm afraid Empress Masako is maybe the perfect embodiment of everything that Mira was talking about. I mean, one of the most shocking things I've witnessed in public life there, many of you know that she was really one of the brightest people in, in the whole of Japan. She'd been educated at Oxford, at Harvard. She was the glowing star of the Foreign Service Department in the Japanese government. The last thing she wanted was to marry into that royal imperial family. And in those days, I would hear that whenever the crown prince, who seems like a reasonable, nice, engaging man, whenever he would show interest in any young woman, she'd race off and get her ears pierced. Because as soon as her ears pierced, she was technically impure and she was ineligible to be married. Um, but he'd been through so many candidates at that point, I think, that they, they were getting less rigorous in their selection. And as you probably remember, two times great pressure was brought on her father. Your daughter owes it to the country to marry the crown prince, and that's not what she wanted to do. And so quickly after her marriage, beyond anything we've witnessed with Diana or are likely to wit witness with Meghan, um, she became literally voiceless. Um, and barely able to do her, perform her public duties. And it's been moving and surprising to me to see how her husband has rallied very bravely behind her and spoken out on her behalf, chastised the press, chastised the country for not giving an empress a chance to speak. But really, the odds are stacked against her. And when Miro was talking about how hierarchical and in some ways stuck in its ways Japan is, of course, that's at its most extreme within the imperial household. Um, the former crown prin the former empress, uh, Michiko-sama, I think is one of the most revered women in Japan. She just radiates intelligence and kindness, especially when people are in times of need. 
But as I remember, such pressure was brought to bear on her when she was in the palace, she couldn't speak for a whole month. And this is, one of, again, one of the strongest women you could imagine. So. I think they, both uh, uh, Empress Michiko and Namasako, they spend most of their life discreetly having nervous breakdowns. I mean, yeah. this was so obvious, but so uh, discreetly publicized, uh, yeah. but they do. I think uh, we're running out of time, but I will allow one more question. Hello. Hello. Thank you for uh, coming here and talking about your book and being part of this festival. It's our first time, and I think one of the reasons that the three of us could, um, could you were drawn, speak up a little? It, the, one of the reasons that the three of us, I've come with my husband and our friend, were drawn to your books is because um, uh, we're part of the, that population, that global population that's privileged to, you know, go somewhere else and call someplace our home. Um, and so, um, part of uh, what you said about uh, your question about fleeing and pursuing also, I think, has struck a chord with me. Um, how do you balance uh, that need to belong, you know, with the need to stay out of, the, of that um, group or society so that you can be the sharp observer that you are of the places that you write about? What's, you know, how much of you wants to belong and how much of you wants to pull back and be the gaijin, you know, who has the freedom to move around from place to place, finding the home that you want to belong to. Thank you. Really, these, one after another, these are some of the most thoughtful questions that I've heard in years. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a conscious choice on my part to remain outside a, a place. In the case of Japan, it's an acknowledgement of a reality that that's what my neighbors would prefer and that's what it always will be. Um, but I think it's like this, this, it's the same that one would have the same relationship with a, a partner, a spouse. In other words, one, one is hoping one couldn't be closer to the person one loves, but you'll never be exactly that person. And a part of you gains and a part of her gains from the fact that you are a little outside her. And so, it's interesting, so my wife uh, has never read a word I've, I've written because having Eng English isn't good enough and my works aren't in Japanese. But if I have any question about publishing, um, I'll only ask my wife because she reads me so well. And I'll say, oh, I'm wanting to write a novel. She said, well, don't you remember, 17 years ago you should, said you should never write a novel because you're incompetent at it. And I know she's right. <laughs> um, and in other words, so she couldn't be more sympathetic to me, but I'm so glad she's outside me. And, uh, and, and it's sort of a walking dictionary of the many things that I've said and done that she recalls, and I try to be the same uh, with her. I think the writer's, as your question suggests, the writer's job is always to be an outsider. And if I'm writing about my mother, or my hometown, or myself, I have to be an outsider because um, the reader is an outsider that the reader has never met any of those three, and I have to see how any of them would look to a regular bystander while trying to be as within them as possible. But I don't think it's a conscious choice. So I will say, maybe to tie your question in with Mira's first question, initially I probably was fleeing a sense of belonging because I was so comfortable just as this loose item Flit, flitting around the world by myself. Because as a little boy growing up, I was 6,000 miles from the nearest relative, and I'm an only child, so very comfortable being by myself, and probably that was what I was most happy to be. But now I feel I have quite a strong sense of belonging towards Japan and towards my family and towards my friends, and yet, of course, I know I will never be them. So I don't feel it's a choice I have to make or even it's a balance I have to strike. Um, I think... For me, the challenge is getting as close as possible to the people I care about, because the outsiderness will always be there in all of us, whoever we are, whatever our jobs are. Um, but the writer's job is, secondly, to, to imagine the world as it looks to people radically different from herself, and really to enter the shoes and the skin and the being of somebody very, very different. So, for example, when I write about woman, as I've written about my wife quite a bit, that's a great challenge for me, um, to be outside enough to convey it to you as an outsider, but really to see how the world looks from within her. Uh, 
Um, and I must say, as since you were saying, your kindred spirits as members of this new community where we have many, many different homes, and in a place like Singapore, probably nearly everybody in this room is in that community. It's so exciting to me that that seems to be the, the honorary community of the new century and that we share questions with one another. And I probably have more in common with almost anybody in this room than I do with somebody who's entirely Indian, entirely English, or entirely Japanese or Californian. Uh, and as a kid, I was always the only kid in the class who had two or three homes. And it seemed like such an unusual uh, and fortunate privilege. And now, any room in Singapore, the majority of people are in that category. And it's wonderful that the world is moving so quickly in that direction. And of course, various demagogues around the world are trying to resist that. Nationalism is on the rise, probably because it's on the run. But at an individual level, each time we make a friendship or form a relationship with somebody from a different background, and that happens every hour in Singapore, suddenly another wall dissolves. And I'm so glad that uh, we're all part of a community in which we define ourselves by our passions more than our passports. So thank you all. There are lots more questions. I'd be happy to entertain them at the signing table, which is downstairs, I think. Council. I have just one very, very quick question for you. Okay. All right, last question. The last line of Autumn Light is, hold this moment forever, I tell myself. It may never come again. Pico, at this stage in your life, what do you believe? Oh. <laughs> you asked that question of Paul Thoreau. Did many I? Many years ago, yeah. Yeah, he probably gave a good answer, too. Um, <laughs> So, uh, thank you, thank you for that question. <laughs> uh, quickly, quickly. Yeah, so I think all my life is about putting reality and possibility into the same sentence. So I want to see the world as it is, that's why I've been traveling, but I never want to lose hope for it. And that's why I wrote a book about the Dalai Lama, and that's why I wrote a book about autumn, being in the blue skies and the rusting leaves together. There's that beautiful um, poem by Seamus Heaney when Nelson Mandela was let out of prison in the 1990s, Seamus Heaney wrote, once in a lifetime, hope and history can rhyme. Oh, that's beautiful. It is. Yeah. And so I think my, what I believe is that hope and history can rhyme. Mm. I'm basically a natural optimist, but I want to look at the most difficult parts of the world and often the most difficult parts of myself to make sure I'm not losing a sense of reality. Uh, it's easy to be hopeful, but reality is what gives that yeah. hope real yeah. substance. So... That's the short answer. Pico, thank you so much for giving thank us you. your time. Pico, Pico's not only given us his time, but he's given us something much rarer. He's given us his insights and his wisdom, which is not what you always get in a session. So I thank you very much, Pico. And I thank all of you for coming and for listening to us today. There's going to be book signings downstairs if anyone wants to, to buy a book. So I hope to see you downstairs. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mira.